My name is Beth Reynolds. I'm the program specialist for the Beef Center. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to get this webinar series kicked off. This is the first webinar of a series of four. Tonight we're going to talk about winter feeding management and hear from Drs. Garland Dalkey and Katie Lapolis. We're excited to get started and we'll hand the microphone over to Dr. Garland. All right, here we go. Things are working now, I hope. But um, anyway, what we got here is uh, some winter feed consider in considering the quality forecast on the feed that we've made this past year. And we had a few issues with weather. We had a late spring and, uh, and we had a little bit of rain during the summer on and off. The farther north you went, the worse it got. The farther east you went, the worse it got. So anyway, we had some of that. And then this fall, things got a little bit muddy too, depending on what you were trying to do and when you were trying to do it. So things got a little bit, I don't know, a little bit inconvenience, I guess, for the most part. It's just another year, I guess, on the farm. But um, the first thing I'm dealing with here, and I'm bringing up, is this, this hurried harvest situation. I got this thing in my way. Hopefully I can see the screen all right. And um, what we got here is this is haylage, second crop haylage, and this happened to a lot of people. Either you didn't get it cut or you want to get it cut and have some quality there. A lot of times you got rushed a bit. And um, if you look where my arrow is, I know this stuff is going to be probably small and you probably can't see it real good if you're looking at a big screen far away. But uh, the real issue here is this was haylage. It was second crop, went into a bunker silo. And um, the moisture on this stuff turned out to be about 81% in this situation, dry matter 18%. That was a problem. If it was direct cut, it would probably be about 85% moisture and 15% dry matter. So, I mean, this wasn't much different than direct cut stuff. And that, that makes some issues. Okay, one thing is your fermentation gets a little bit out of whack. You get a cold fermentation generally. And if you look at the pH on this, it's over 5. And generally when you're making haylage, you know, it should be below 5, around 4.5 or so. If you make corn silage, of course, it should be 4 or less. But this becomes a, a problem now for storage in the bunker silo. And um, I say the deal was here, they wanted to save the quality. It was a nice field. It was, you know, 19, 20% protein. Quick on to get it off before it started raining for another week. And um, they rushed it, and this is what happened. And if you look at the rest of the analysis, it really doesn't look too far out of whack, it looks like good stuff. The problem is if you start doing a fermentation analysis on it, then things look a little funny. If you smell it, it smells terrible. It, you could smell the butyric acid and added some fishy smells and some other things. It was really quite a specimen. But just looking at a forage analysis, you wouldn't think nothing of it. It's when you started smelling it, and if you start feeding it, then you start having issues. I, I guess I can do it. All right, here we go. I was lucky enough to get the picture of this calf before and after it was being fed this haylage. And before it was feeding, you can see it's a nice, shiny, slick, black Angus calf steer. And uh, they weaned it, they put it in the feed yard, and um, it just didn't do very well, along with about 300 of its pen mates or whatever, contemporary group mates. And you can see that on the right after they've been feeding it for a while that the, the hair coat got real dull. Actually, it didn't, they didn't grow very well at all. And um, it was kind of a disaster. And this kind of haylage, this happens quite a bit. And younger calves, you see it real nice, like this picture here. And um, it, what, you got, what you got going on is a lot of your protein that's in that feed starts breaking down. It becomes forms of putrescine and a few other things. You start ending up getting some NPN out of the deal because the protein's breaking down because of the fermentation that occurred. You start getting some bacteria growth that you really don't want happening. Listeria can grow in this real well, and a few other things when that pH gets over five. And instead of haylage, you end up with something more like compost, and it's it's not a good situation. Now these calves, you could see it kind of nice here before and after. The stuff didn't kill anybody. But they didn't do very well either. And actually, haylage can work quite well with calves if you make it right. But if you let it get like this, then you start having troubles. And that's what happened here. 
you're going to also have a lot of trouble if you try feeding this to cows you know, when they get close to calving. And um, it's what kills a lot of dairy cows, and um, beef cows are no different in this part. So when you get to be well, within two months of calving, I wouldn't feed this kind of haylage. You're going to have trouble for sure, okay? And just kind of a warning and a heads up. If you do got a bunker silo full of this stuff and you don't know what to do with it, I'm not going to be much help here because it's really hard to fix a problem like this. You can kind of use it in feed yard rations a little bit. I mean, the, the nitrogen's there, the NPN, but there are some issues with it. It's not real, it doesn't smell good, it doesn't help their appetite at all, but it, it's, a, it's a problem. But I guess I would keep it away from these little guys when you're trying to wean them, and I would keep it away from your cows prior to calving at least two months before they calve because they, they can have some problems, okay? There's, it's, it could be a, any of a number of problems actually depending on what all happens and what grows in this stuff. But I say when you do have a pH over five, you can get a lot of bacteria growth that you don't want like Listeria, E. coli, Salmonella. A lot of these things will grow when that pH is above five and um, it's a problem. So try and avoid it. And, okay, my next thing here is the other end of the equation, delayed harvest. The first one was a hurried harvest. This is delayed harvest. This is some corn silage. It's from one of the research farms here at Iowa State. And actually, this stuff is manageable. And um, especially in cold weather, it's not as big of a deal. I got some little stars on my thing. It's hard to read. But the first thing is the dry matter. And if you look at the dry matter on this corn silage, it's almost 60% dry matter. And right next to it are two columns. And this is from Rock River Lab. This is their analysis. But they gave you like a 60-day average and a four-year average of where their corn silages are coming in into their lab. And if you look at the four-year average, generally corn silage averages about 38% dry matter, roughly around there. And I say this stuff is 59.75. It was a delayed harvest. And so the plants got mature, dried down. And um, so dry matter is the first thing. With that dry matter being higher like that, it will it has a harder time fermenting versus if it was on the wetter side. So that can be some storage issues. So you got to be sure you get this stuff covered up and packed well, or you're going to have some problems. Now the the thing we got is kind of a saving grace with a delayed harvest like this is cold weather comes quicker, and so when things are cold, you usually don't have as much trouble. It's come about. March, April, when things warm up, then it can start to get away on you and get rotten. So I guess as long as you're aware of it, if you feed it up before then, it's not a big deal. If you end up having to feed it into the summer, you want to be sure you get it packed well and covered well and um, sealed up good. Here's a good application for putting like a, a syrup from the distiller's plant on top to seal it. That does work pretty nice when you got dry stuff like this to seal in all the gaps. and get the air out and then cover it, but just be aware of that. The next thing, the next star down my list there is the soluble protein and the crude protein both. Generally when you let the plants get mature, your crude protein will go down. And corn silage doesn't have a lot of protein to start with, but it will bring it down further because the protein that's in the, the stalk is kind of disappearing and it's going somewhere. And the, the soluble protein, is also going to be a little less than if it was put up when it was 38 percent dry matter. Okay, so just be aware of that. It feeds a little bit different that way. Usually not a big deal, but it, it is a little different. If you go down to the third star, that's the NDF, and you'll notice that in this situation our NDF is, is actually down. I think it was chopped a little higher, left more stock in the field, but then also you're getting more starch buildup in the kernels, and so that's it's kind of displacing some of the NDF in the park. So chopping higher in this case brought my NDF down, but in reality that NDF is there and it probably won't go away if you chop at your normal heights. If you look down the next star, it's the sugar, and the sugar content is probably about half of what it normally would be from waiting this long. But most of that sugar is converted into starches. The, the stock sugar, of course, is not there no more. But because of the starch buildup in the kernels, it makes up for the difference. The ammonia, or the nitrogen, as a part of a crude protein is actually less in this kind of silage because it doesn't degrade as much. It's little, it holds it in place. And some of that gets held within the fiber. So that, that's kind of a nice thing. The P 
pH, and this sample's really pretty good yet, considering everything. It's about just just touch over four. And uh, normally, if you get corn silage made early and ripe on, right on time, it should be less than four. So this is won't be quite as stable, but it, it's not as bad as what it could be, okay, because it was packed well. If you look down a little farther, there's another star, and it starts dealing with NDF digestibility, 24, 30, 48 hours, 120, 240. Those are the time points from the lab that they give you. And if you compare the what this sample is versus what the four-year average is, it's probably only about, oh, it's a fraction of what it normally would be. And that's because that NDF is less digestible at this time. And so the forage content is, isn't quite going to give you the boost that you would expect it to. Now, the total energy in this sample probably isn't too bad because we got a lot more starch than normal. But um, I say the f energy from the forage aspect is going to be cut probably in half from what it normally would be. And it's also going to break down slower than what's normally expected. And that'll bring your energy down as well. So there's just things to be aware of when you feed this. And so kind of things to keep aware of, and I say you can use it, and it actually feeds pretty well, but it, it's maybe not what you're used to or expecting. Now on the side here, I got a graph that shows the mole contents that Dairyland Labs out of Wisconsin have been catching, you know, from the samples. And this is two years, goes back to 18. And there were a little bit of mold showing up there. Now this year, the samples haven't really been coming in yet. I got this at the end of October. And um, because the harvest had been delayed so much, they haven't been getting many samples. So we'll see what happens in the spring with this deal. But I expect if it's not packed well, you're going to have quite a bit of mold going on. This next slide shows the yeast counts that have been observed so far. The, the slide that's in blue is from Rock River Labs. And they're a pretty big lab around the world now. And um, the blue dots that are on it are all samples from the Midwest. And then there's a blue line, and that shows the averages, kind of the trend of what was being saw. And I say there's a couple years worth of data here, too. But where the dip is, where it goes down, that's been wintertime. Okay, so there's less yeast growth in the wintertime because it's got to be warm for those guys to grow. But then you can see it peak in the starting about April, it starts going uphill, it gets pretty high to about September, and then it goes down again. That's new harvest stuff. But you can see way at the tail end here, you start seeing that tail go up again. And that was this year's uh, silage starting in, the, in um, September. So the, the trend is that there's a pretty good yeast count out there, and a lot of it's from this harvest issue that I brought up on the previous slide. And Dairyland Labs is right next to it there with their yeast count. So they're seeing the same thing at their lab. So that's those, and just kind of be aware of them. Um, the haylage thing with that early harvest or hurried harvest, that's something that's kind of unmanageable in some ways. This other one with the delayed harvest, that is something you can kind of get ahead of and prevent some trouble. Now the, the third topic I'm going to talk about here is um, mycotoxins. And there's some management practices that we do nowadays that we all get kudos for doing, but in reality, they also bring on mycotoxins, and it's, a, it's an issue. Bunker silos are a nice way to introduce some molds and stuff in your feed, because you've got this big open face, and as you're digging out the silage every day, you, know, you kind of leave it open, and that can be a problem. The other thing is, when you're driving over that pile to get a good pack, which you need to do, you also inoculate that silage with what's ever on your tractor tires, and that can be a problem. The uh, round bales, we know that what, what that can be. That's always a mold thing, especially when we let them sit out and if they're not packed well or covered and all that. But that's, so that's an issue. But no-till planting, reduced till planting, that's a real nice way to introduce mycotoxins into a crop. And um, I mean, we have hybrids and, you know, that can take it. Where years ago, we, you know, we couldn't do this 50 years ago and get away with it as easy as we can now. You know, the emergence and all that wouldn't let that happen. And if you look in the world of vegetables, you know, they can't do this either. They got a moldboard plow and get all the residue under the ground because of all the plant viruses and moles and stuff that, because veggies are pretty sensitive to that. But our corn and soybean varieties, you know, they can take that and a lot of alfalfa, they, you know, they're bred to take all these moles and mycotoxins and plant viruses and all the things that can kill a plant. And they grow through it. And a lot of these molds, 
they inoculate the plant as it's coming out of the ground. And in, before we ever harvest the feed, a lot of times we're getting mycotoxin problems. And finally, this, the other one, that's from top dressing a field there. And top dressing manure is a nice way to introduce mycotoxins as well and molds and a lot of other problems. So my friends at Rock River Lab and at Dairyland Lab, they supplied me some data on what they're seeing so far this year. This, the line that's with the red line, that's kind of the baseline of what normal vomitoxin levels are. And you can kind of see that it dips. And this past year, it's kind of gone up. And it's, it's above the, the average. And I guess I'd expect that. Because vomitoxin is a mold that likes the cool, wet weather. And um, so when you got a cool year, a wet year, or even not so wet either, this one kind of likes it. It thrives pretty good. So this is the, it makes a reddish colored mold. And, um, and I say the, the mold may or may not have the mycotoxin there, but I say you generally see vomitoxin when you have a cool wet year. So up north, it's a bigger problem generally, but um, I think this year you'll see it more places. And the slide next to it is what Dairyland Lab has been seeing with their samples, and they haven't gotten many in yet. But about this time of the year, they really start pouring in, and I suspect we'll see a trend upwards in vomitoxin this year. It does look like it already from Rock River Lab. Aflatoxin is one that everybody talks about because you get it on the corn. It's that green mold sometimes. And um, this year, I don't think we'll see much. And the uh, little graph here from Dairyland Lab kind of indicates that, too. There's a couple spots here and there, but really not a big problem. Because I say generally when you get aflatoxin, it's from a drought year. So a couple years ago when they were having the big drought in Texas and southern Missouri, there was a lot of aflatoxin down that country. And a lot of that corn got salvaged and got sent up here to Iowa, and Nebraska, Kansas to be fed because he couldn't feed it to dairy cattle or people or pigs. And a lot of beef cattle got it. And so I say we, we use quite a bit of this in a salvage situation sometimes, but you kind of got to watch it. It does have some issues. But I don't think you'll see much this year. There were a few dry spots around the country in the, like the southeast. So if they have any corn being salvaged, it may end up in Iowa. But I don't think we'll see a whole lot of this. There's a couple other molds out there. Zeralinone, everybody kind of heard about that. That's the one that kind of acts like an estrogen. And looking at the Rock River Lab deal this year, it looks like the trend is downward. doesn't look like there's a whole lot out there. And the dairy land, probably, it's kind of sparse, too, on the end. So I don't know if that one will be a problem. It doesn't look like it at this point. A couple of years ago, it was. And there was some issues about it. But I don't know if it will be one this year. Here's a T2 toxin. And I don't know what years give you better T2 toxin than other. Generally, it's, it's in wetter conditions. But this toxin seems to be most I don't know. You see it more times when you top dress manure on a field or city sludge from a city municipal waste. And that's where you, you'll get this one. And I say it's kind of hit and miss when you have it. But when you do have it, it's a bad one. Sometimes people get it mixed up with salmonella because you get bloody diarrhea. And, um, and it's a mean, mean thing if you ever get it. So I said, years ago, I used to peddle feed for a living. And there was a, the worst case of this I ever saw was north of Wausau, Wisconsin, where there was a, a farmer. He top dressed his alfalfa fields with uh, sludge from the city. And um, it was good fertilizer. And it made the crops really do well. But it was a big mistake, too. And his whole herd of cows got a bloody diarrhea. And it took a while to figure it out. But this is what it was. It was T2 toxin. So it's out there. And, so you kind of seems to be worse when you on fields where you top dress manure and, and city waste. There's a, another situation. That's another mycotoxin situation. This was about three years ago, and this is from a producer in eastern Iowa. He was trying to breed 150 heifers. He had them all synchronized. They all looked good. Looked really good actually. He synchronized them, bred them, and out of the hundred and 50 head, he got about 25 pregnant. And so next thing is he calls me, what do you think the problem is, you know? He went through his protocols for breeding. Everything looked good there. He had enough help to get them run through and stuff. And you, know, you, you start thinking, well, is the semen bad? Is the 
the hormone treatment's bad, you know. So I thought, well, let's take a look at your feed. So we sent this sample in, and this sample went to, we sent a sample to Dairyland Lab, and they do kind of, you know, the big mycotoxins. And uh, then we also took one and we sent it off to Austria. And this went to Tallinn University in Austria, and that's kind of like the mecca of mycotoxin research around the world. And in their panel, they look at 400 different mycotoxins that are possible. And it's kind of nifty. You can see a lot of stuff. Where when we sent it to Dairyland Lab, we got the xeralanone, and that was about it. But then we, when we sent it off to this place in Austria, we got all these others. Now, the xeralanone was high. You can see it was um, 1,200 parts per billion. And when it's over 300, we consider it high. So this was way high in that alone. But then we also had these beta trichophosines, whatever you call them, ergot, alkaloids, these other fumonacins. Okay, and they were kind of low, medium, somewhere in there. But then you see on the side, there's all these toxins per group. So, like, there are two different xeralanones that were found in here on top, three different fumonacins. Okay, so there's you know quite a few there. But then we they have all these other things they look at as well, and. There are 27 different aspergillus toxins in this bunch. There's eight different penicillin molds in here. Overall, there are 71 different toxins or mycotoxins in this sample. And I guess my point is there, there's, there's generally more than just one toxin present. And each of these toxins has its own effects. So you can't just say, well, I, I got fell off my cows, therefore I got mycotoxins. It's not necessarily so, because different things will cause different responses. Some things do absolutely nothing to a cow, but other ones do. And so this, I mean, it had some of the effects of the xeralanone with that estrogen, but there were some other things going on here, especially some neurological issues. And um, so I guess my point is that if you have one mycotoxin, you probably got others. And how they interact with each other, that's another issue that a lot of people are still trying to figure out because they do interact with each other as well. So that makes it kind of problematic. The other thing is, this is a slide from Biomen. And when you harvest these feeds, it's, it's generally not the whole field. You got hot spots here and there. And where it's in yellow, that's some different mycotoxins. And they are hot spots in the bunker silo of, of these different mycotoxins. Now, this didn't happen in the bunker silo. This happened in the field that before it was even harvested. These molds and mycotoxins were growing on the crops out in the field. And there really was no mold on this. This looked like really nice um, corn silage, you know. And, uh, but the thing is, it grows in the field, and it's kind of sneaky that way. And I say it's kind of hit and miss where you may find it or may, where you may not. So as you sample these things, kind of be aware of that. And, Take samples from different places, not just one bale or one spot in your bunker, if you do suspect these to be a problem. And it's, of course, when a YB concern, okay, death is one reason. Some of these things will kill you right away, like the mycotoxins in sweet potatoes. That one will kill cattle overnight. It causes a, a respiratory problem, pneumonia and uh, edema in the lungs, and you can kill a whole pen of cattle overnight literally with that kind of mycotoxin. You get downer cows and a lot of that is they get some neurological problems and they don't know how to get up. And so as you get some central nervous problems like this cow in the picture here, she was, there was a big pen of cull cows and she got exposed to a bunch of it and uh, she got brain damage from it. And we knew about it because when she died we took her head off and sent the brain to the diagnostic lab at Iowa State and it came back with no cholinesterase left in her system so that she got kind of crazy and died on us. So ketosis also, anorexia, impaired immune function, impaired milk production, impaired reproduction, cancer, like aflatoxin, that'll give you cancer, ulcers, twisted stomachs, sores, arthritic legs and limbs and overall poor performance and unthriftiness. There's a whole bunch of things. They say every mycotoxin seems to have its own little quirk on what it's going to do. And so you, I say kind of a tough one to always diagnose. And some of them, I don't know if we'll ever figure out what they are. So it's just kind of the nature of them. Here's a, a deal with fatty livers. And the right, there's the big liver there, and the, that's some beef liver. And that's what it's supposed to look like normally when you cut it in half. 
And then I got this other one out of a research journal. They used a chicken here because they, could, they fed chicken different levels of aflatoxin. You could see the normal liver on top nice and dark. Then these other livers, based on how much aflatoxin they were exposed to. And you can see in the ultrasound, too, all the fat shows up. And so some of your mycotoxins, like the vomitoxin, that's degraded in the rumen under some situations. But stuff like aflatoxin isn't so much. And your liver strains it out of the bloodstream. And when it gets to the liver, what it does is it, it, it sets up shop and it actually kills the liver cells. So then you start getting this fat buildup. And people talk about fatty liver issues. And a lot of times that fatty liver is really from dead liver tissue going on. And the fat just starts building up, building up, and pretty soon you got a problem. And a lot of these animals that get this, they look pretty good until they have a calf. And then they just mysteriously fall apart and die, and you wonder what happened to them. And um, the dairy farmers, they know what this is about. They run into it quite a bit. But, you know, we see it in beef cattle, too, and I say it's just kind of mysterious death syndrome kind of going on. But in reality, a lot of times this liver gets exposed to it, and it's, it's not like a big bunch of aflatoxin all at once. It's all winter long, just constant exposure to it. And other mycotoxins will do the same thing. I say the liver is kind of a tries to get it out of the system to save the animal, and in the process it can kind of pollute itself. And so that's a problem. And a lot, a lot of times when you've got real nice looking cows that fall apart at calving, this is kind of what's probably going on and it's worth checking out. Okay, so the fix with mycotoxins. Now, if you're a feed salesman, I used to be one, you know, you kind of cash in on this because you can sell a lot of stuff and sometimes. Some things work, some things don't work. So like everybody talks about binders, like clay binders and then like the yeast cell wall material like Alltech makes, and they work a little bit on some things, but not all of them. They're not a one thing fix all, okay? And the other thing with binders are they also tie up some other things, some of your trace minerals. So if you already got impaired immune system function and you tie up your copper and zinc, you're gonna kind of add to that problem. So in, especially if you've got the wrong binder here because they say not all mycotoxins will attach with the binders, okay? Chlorine is used in some situations. There's some enzymes that are used and uh, like the Biomin slide I had, they use enzymes in their product and they, they work on primarily like vomitoxin but they don't work so good on aflatoxin so it's kind of hit and miss and then out of the other 398 identified mycotoxins it's hard to say how they'll work on those, okay? Ozone can be used in some situations and UV light and uh, the ozone is kind of used sometimes with aflatoxin but if you had it in corn if you can keep the corn all enclosed and tight airtight and you pump ozone and it can kind of break down that aflatoxin a little bit. UV lights used on some toxins okay. Then there's some microorganisms that can be used to help break these down. It's hard to feed them though to, to make it happen. There's some prebiotics that, and probiotics that kind of work with microorganisms on that. But I say that's all a lot of hit and miss a lot of times, whether it works or not. There's some additives that you can use to prevent problems. I say the organic acids. So they, they can help a little bit. Because I say if the pH is below 5, a lot of your problems go away in terms of mold in storage. But if the the mycotoxins there before you ever harvest the feed, well, it's not going to help you a whole lot there. There's some inoculants that help things happen in uh, ammonia sometimes. There's some sugars that you can add, and actually they enhance fermentation to get your pH down. So there's some odds and ends you can do there. But I guess I'm going to just talk about the, the no-cost method, and that's the, the rumen protozoa are kind of a handy bug to have. And in my slide here, you can see there's some big dots and some little dots. The real little dots are bacteria, and you probably can't even see those. The bigger dots are the protozoa, and they're, I don't know, maybe 100 times the size of the bacteria. They're pretty big, but a lot of those protozoa can engulf, denature, and degrade, and even utilize some of those mycotoxins. They don't do all of them, okay, like aflatoxin probably will get by them. But vomitoxin, these guys can consume and get rid of, and it's kind of a nice thing, okay? So it's just kind of a nice natural protection. Now, the problem with that is in a feed yard diet or if you got some subacute rumen acidosis, which is that sero word there, 
they don't work anymore. Protozoa are pretty pH sensitive. And in this first slide, or this slide on the side where it says normal pH, you can see that within 24 hours, that green bar, all the mycotoxin that was there and at zero hours is gone. They say those protozoa eat that all up. And this is vomitoxin that it's working on. That's kind of a nice thing. But right in the slide right next to it, where it says sera conditions, or the subacute ruminacidosis, there I got it circled there. In, or before that, in that 24-hour period, that's all gone. In this situation, only about 10% of that uh, vomitoxin is gone, and the rest is still there. And then that leads to some, some belly problems. They get some gut health issues, and um, that's a problem. They say so acidosis or even subacute acidosis stops the protozoa doing their job. Okay. The other things that can stop protozoa from doing their job are our ionophores, so rumensin, bovitec, catalyst. These guys can knock out protozoa as well. It may be over time that the protozoa get used to it and come back to life, I don't know. But immediately, in the short term, they do knock it out. So I guess my point is here, if you do have a problem with vomitoxin, and especially in a cow rash, and you may want to consider keep making sure that they, they're not overdosing them on starches where you get acidosis, and you may want to consider pulling these ionophores out in the short term because uh, it, it does hinder the effectiveness of the protozoa to naturally remove the, or the mycotoxin. So I guess then the third area that I would consider, especially with a mycotoxin problem, is your diet formulation. Okay, so first thing is you want to prevent acidosis or subacute acidosis, but you still need to provide adequate fermentable carbohydrate. Okay, now that, and I, you need that because that, that becomes a glucose source for the animal, and that's what they need to live on for, for their brain, for the developing calf that they may be carrying for milk production, especially in a cow. So you need to kind of keep that in mind, but you don't want to overdose it, okay? So you've got to pay attention to what you're doing. The other thing you don't want to overdose is rumen degradable protein. Because as I mentioned, especially with aflatoxin, it, the liver straight is straining that out, and it may be compromised. And when you have a compromised liver, then the protein metabolism gets kind of, I don't know, compromised as well. And they can't take all that excess nitrogen. So you don't want to use urea in one of these diets. You kind of want to balance it with natural proteins and not overdose it in that situation. You got to be pay a little closer attention. Okay. Protein solubility, you got to keep that to a minimum. Now solubility and degradability aren't the same thing. Sometimes they get mixed up, but they aren't. Solubility just means that it's soluble in water. Okay, It may or may not be degraded. Where the degradable protein is degraded in the rumen. But the solubility issue isn't also an issue because that can be protein in your bloodstream that ends up going to the liver. So you don't want to overdose your liver with anything. You've got to keep it pretty intact. You want to formulate your minerals and vitamins to be in line with the requirements. You don't want to overdose these either because you, I say all the excess has to go somewhere and you've got to watch it there. And you got to keep dietary fat to a minimum. So if you do have liver damage, you don't want to send a lot of excess fat to the liver. Okay. Ionophores, I say, I, I say you probably don't want to use them, but sometimes they are helpful because they do help make glucose precursors by changing the fermentation in the rumen. So sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I, I'd kind of be careful with that. And then the last thing here is a B vitamin called choline. And the dairy world has figured it out to use this when you have fatty liver. And it could be a, a life-saving situation for your beef cow, too, if you got some high-value cows and you want to save them if they have fatty liver issues. Now, with choline, you got to use the, the rumen bypass kind, and that's kind of pricey stuff. And generally, with my cow on the my Charlotte cow, that was a wintertime calving. And there, you know, things are kind of touch and go anyway. But... The choline is really where they are needed is in these wintertime calvings. If the cow calves on pasture, like the other one, the Angus cow there, there's so much natural choline in the, the green grass that it doesn't make any difference. But I say if they're eating stored feed and they have a liver issue, that's where the choline can work and can maybe save the day. So I guess that's all I got. And if there's questions, I'll maybe answer them.
Next, we will listen to Dr. Katie Lapolis talk about late gestation and early lactation nutritional management of cows. Um, hopefully you guys are enjoying the convenience of watching at home and uh, definitely still send questions our way. So here's Katie. All right. Thanks, Beth. And thanks, Garland. I think I'm kind of going to um, go off on um, a similar path where Garland was going um, and keep talking about some of our nutritional management of cows. Um, but in this case, I'm really going to start focusing on our late gestation and early lactational management, um, predominantly because uh, that's pretty much where many of us in a spring calving season are at. But also because um, this last winter, um, we had many producers that ended up getting um, themselves in a bind with the rough winter and depleting forage resources and had cows that really shed out pretty skinny and weren't able to catch up and so we want to hopefully be able to get on top of that and get ahead of it. Um, so when I look at what a goal of a nutritional program needs to be, um, this is definitely going to be a little bit of a review, um, but what I want is I want to make sure that I'm meeting every cow's requirements because generally I'm going to have different requirements of those cows and we'll go about through that in a, here in a second. And I want to do that in order for her to maintain adequate body condition score um, when we're going um, through these high uh, nutritional requirement times. And I want to do that on a least cost basis this use of strategic use of my feedstuffs that I have available to me. And in general, um, what I'm thinking is that I want to, um, that cow to be able to produce a healthy calf, but then I want her to go ahead and be able to follow that up by rebreeding early. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of her during this time. So when I go into developing this nutritional program, um, there's a few steps that I like to think about. The first is that I need to know what that cow's needs are, um, and then go and look at the feedstuffs that I have, the base diet that I have, determine the nutrient content of that. Um, I then need to use that to figure out where my deficiencies are, and then figure out what my supplemental feed availability that I have available to me is, um, and what her needs are to make sure that I'm meeting her requirements. And so there's a lot of things that are going to determine our nutrient requirements here. And I'm not going to go through these in, um, in adequate detail except for our stage of production tonight. Um, but the weight and the size of my cows, the frame, um, the age of the cow definitely is going to have a huge impact on the nutrient requirement. Um, stage of production, definitely. Um, the body condition of that, of that animal, whether she needs to gain in condition. And I will plug here too is that we have a body condition score fact sheet that should be located in the webinar resources that you can have available to you that's specific to winter body condition scoring cows that can help this time of year. Um, but environment as well. And there's only so many things that we can do by hand. Um, and we can use a ration formulation software such as our brands formulation software um, that can help us do this. But if I'm going to need to do this by hand, we can go through that here um, in a few moments. Um, but when I'm looking at that cow's biological cycle, what her requirements are going to be are going to determine um, fairly significantly throughout the year. Um, and generally, we'll look at that split out between this post-calving, early lactation, and prior to breeding time period. About 82 days is what I'll put that at. Um, after that, after we've hopefully got her rebred, um, she'll go through this early pregnancy. That new fetus is not going to require a whole lot, um, but then she'll also be lactating that new calf. Um, we generally consider that for another 120 some days. After weaning, she'll go into the lowest requirements of her um, biological cycle in this mid gestation period. And then, about 50 to 60 days prior to calving, um, we'll put her into this uh, pre calving period. Um, and in particular, for today's um, talk, we're just going to really focus on that pre-calving um, and post-calving period because they are uh, some of the most critical time periods of that cow's cycle. So we're going to see this chart um, a couple times tonight, um, and I like it for a lot of reasons, um, but I just want you to keep in mind while you see this, um, this is an assumption based um, off of NRC requirements for a 1,400 pound mature cow um, at moderate body condition score, above average milking ability, um, weaning at six months, which I think is pretty classic here in the Midwest. Um, and as you see on that bottom axis there, it'll change on how many months she's been since calving. Um, 
and then on your left axis we'll either see a protein requirement or in this next one a TDN requirement and in both of those st classes and both of those stages we'll see that within the first few months after calving um, she'll have the highest protein and TDN requirements um, that are going to slowly taper off as that cow goes from peak lactation and that calf starts to transition to having more of a reliance on forages um, instead of the dam and here we have weaning at six months so you'll see that uh, fairly uh, straight um, drop off of her what her requirements are is she no longer has to provide for that um, calf that's on the ground um, but after that point you'll slowly start to see that start to increase again um, towards the level right at calving um, as that fetus starts to develop and we start to see a lot of that fetal growth so when we look at this pre-calving period, this is going to be our second most nutritional period that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and like I said, we'll see that maximum fetal development, generally about 75% of that fetal growth. Um, and that cow is beginning to prepare her colostrum as well, which requires quite a bit of protein um, as she starts to put those immunoglobulins into that colostrum. So we really need to make sure that we're meeting, um, and what I'm going to talk about mostly today is our crude protein as well as our TDN requirements during this time. Um, and at this point um, in where we're at, we need to make sure that her body condition score is what we would consider adequate. So generally about that five and a half um, uh, body condition score, um, because generally when she gets to this point, um, it's going to be almost impossible, if not extremely expensive, uh, to get her to improve body condition score during this time um, and if we don't have her at moderate it'll set her back quite a bit. Um, any types of nutritional deficiencies um, during this time we could see a, an array um, of characteristics some of which we saw this spring um, but we could see some impaired fetal development um, we could see reduced milk production um, as well as colostrum quality and if that cow can't produce um, as much milk as she possibly could um, we'll see some reduced calf performance and weaning weights and if that colostrum quality really isn't great either um, that calf isn't getting the health um, that first health that it really needs to get from that dam um, and we'll start seeing some increased uh, susceptibility to morbidity as well as mortality of those calves um, and we'll also see some poor rebreeding rates of those cows as well and so I get questioned quite a bit as what is the perfect body condition score by the time we get to calving and I like to compare this to Goldilocks and the three bears that you know we need to have her just right by that point. Um, too thin of cows, um, we're just not going to have enough energy for her to calve um, but cows that are just obese um, they're going to really start filling um, that birth canal with some of that um, kidney, pelvic and heart fat, right? That pelvic fat um, and she's going to have some uh, run into issues with calving as well. So we want to make sure that we're not obese either. So some specific feedstuffs considerations that I have um, is definitely utilizing some of our higher quality forages that we have available um, because some of those lower um, quality forages that are lower on TDN um, that can really start to limit how much forage that she can consume and if we're starting to limit that then it reduces the amount of nutrition that she can get from that forage. Now if we do need to utilize some of those lower quality forages, um, we'll, we, we will need to use some type of supplementation to either give her some of that uh, additional energy um, and maybe even some additional protein to help those rumen bugs do what they need to do. Um, and before we get to calving, generally I'm, I'm probably thinking, starting to think about it now is that I can start sorting those cows um, prior to pre, um, when we're in this pre-calving period before she calves um, to make sure that I'm uh, strategically supplementing my cows, that those thinner, younger um, cows are getting that supplementation that they need without being bullied by some of those older, fatter cows. Now one of the questions that I get quite a bit um, when it comes to providing enough energy and higher quality feeds to these cows um, is that, you know, what about increased dystocia rates? Um, and with this case, I'm not talking about getting those cats fa cows fat. Um, if you get those cows obese, like we talked about, you will see increased dystocia rates. But those cows that are thinner and younger and, you know, moderate, they really need to make sure that their plane of uh, nutrition is being met. And we will see a little bit of an increase in, in birth weights in those calves, um, but our calving difficulty is going to go down um, because if we are keeping those cows on a low plane of energy, um, like I said, she's just not going to have enough energy to calve and we're going to be causing dystocia issues um, in those moderate cows. 
prior work has also seen that in that last month of pregnancy, um, comparing a low versus a high energy diet, um, those low um, energy cows um, had a 30% reduction survival, about almost 60% more scours cases, 20% more mortalities due to scours, and roughly 25 pounds less of weaning weights. All right, so making sure that we're making, uh, meeting that animal's plane of nutrition um, is really critical to improving overall productivity. When looking at the different body condition scores at calving, we see similar um, types of data where that is, this is our body condition score at calving from a two through a six. Um, and overall, that calf takes almost twice as long to stand with some of those thinner cows. And if you look at the IgG that's in the serum of those calves, um, they end up having fewer amounts of immunoglobulins compared to those fatter cows. So don't have nearly as much um, of that first um, antibodies that have been given from the dam through that. And when looking at that ability to rebreed from those cows, when we're looking at a less than a four, um, about a 30% reduction in rebreeding rates compared to those uh, that are at a six. And when looking at our postpartum intervals, we have a much longer postpartum interval for those that did get pregnant at a thin body condition score compared to some that are fatter. And if we really want to keep that, uh, that cow on her um, yearly cycle, um, we really need to make sure that we're keeping that postpartum interval as low as we can um, and need to keep those cows at a decent condition in order to do so. So my response when we usually get those questions about dystocia is um, feeding those low quality feeds pre-calving isn't going to decrease dystocia incidence in those moderate cows, um, but it is going to end up increasing or impacting our cow and calf performance um, in a negative way. So that's why this, uh, this period is so important for us to meet. So um, once we get that calf on the ground, like I said, we enter into this post-calving um, early lactation period. And this is our most crucial period of this cow's life cycle um, in that year because not only is she currently nursing a calf and, and entering into her peak lactation, we're also asking her to rebreed at least within the first 80 to 85 days to keep up with that 365-day uh, program. Now at this point, her nutrient requirements are gonna be the greatest. And this could vary dependent again on the size of the cow, the age of the cow, the milking ability of that cow. But we could see upwards of a two-fold increase in her protein requirements, as well as a 20% to 30% increase in her energy requirements, which is fairly significant considering that cow is getting uh, larger and um, her dry matter intake might be limited. So at this point, we really need to make sure she's at least maintaining body condition score, all right? And we're making sure that she's got plenty of uh, dry matter intake to not only um, provide her enough um, energy to lactate, um, but also to tell her uh, physiology that she's in a good plane of nutrition enough to rebreed. Um, we talked about that dry matter intake um, issue. Um, that first couple of weeks, her uh, stress after calving might impact that. Um, and so we want to make sure that she is getting the best type of nutrition during that time um, and not getting behind. Um, now, we talked a couple of times about moderate body condition score, but I did want to make sure I noted here um, that even in those maybe thinner cows, if we can at least get them to improve in body condition or um, increase towards moderate um, or maintain moderate body condition score, we can improve, improve those rebreeding rates, again, because we're putting that cow in a positive plane of nutrition um, and letting her physiology know that she's in a good spot um, to not only take care of herself and take care of that new calf, um, but to go ahead and conceive another pregnancy. Now these feedstuff considerations, very similar um, to what we've already been talking about, um, but making sure we're having some type of supplementation um, if we do have inadequate forage available. Um, and definitely at this point, I wanna make sure that some of those moderate and, and over body condition scores are being separated um, if we do have some younger heifers um, or thin cows around um, to make sure that we are able to give them more attention to their nutrition. They will definitely be the ones that get more bold lead away from uh, that feed. We want to make sure that they are not getting um, stepped back at all because decrease in their condition at this time is definitely going to increase the rate of failure um, when we look at our rebreeding. Okay. 
Now I've mentioned first calf heifers a few times, um, and really the big thing that I like to make sure that I stress with this is that's because they require more protein and energy density than some of our mature cows. Um, and the biggest reason for this is that not only are they putting energy into lactation and peak lactation, but she's growing in her own as well. Um, and really when you look at the physiological mechanism of the, of the beef cow, uh, reproduction is going to be her last priority of what means the most to her. And so she's um, not going to put any, uh, any priorities for rebreeding back soon um, if she's not having her needs met. And setting her back now, um, we see a decreased lifetime productivity because she'll rebreed slower and end up weaning lesser calves um, in each subsequent year. Um, so we want to make sure that we're getting the most out of that cow and setting her up for success. So this example here um, is just a, an example, again, a 1,000-pound yearling um, who will mature to about our 1,400 pounds, body condition score of 5, and this is about that first three months after she calves. And you'll see that similar, she needs about 3.3 pounds of protein a day and 17.4 pounds of TDN. Um, she needs a pretty decent amount of protein in that hay, um, probably about 12% protein as well as 65% TDN, um, which is very fairly uh, significant above what we'd expect for our mature cows. Now one of the other things that I wanted to make sure that uh, we mentioned here tonight um, is the effect of cold and wind chill on requirements um, because this is something that really needs to be considered as we move into these colder months um, and something that we ran into quite a bit last year. Um, but in general, we'll see a 13% increase in our requirements for each 10 degree drop below critical temperature. And so for a moderate condition, dry coated, uh, heavy winter coat cow, that critical temperature will be about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. And so for each 10 degree drop, that would be, if the wind chill is negative 10, um, that would be probably about three, um, three of those um, drops, which would increase those uh, requirements 30% roughly, um, which is a fairly an increase, okay? So we want to make sure we're increasing that energy, um, at least a percent per energy drop on, on average, okay? Um, now we usually, you know, most producers that I hear um, and I talk with will say, well, yeah, but she's going to, you know, increase her intake um, when it gets cold, and she will um, to an extent, but that's really not going to be enough to meet her energy requirements, and when that cow is really huddled up with all her buddies, um, the last thing she's going to be thinking about is trying to consume more feed to meet those. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of her during that time. So we've got roughly gone over some of those uh, requirements and why we're talking about this period. Um, so I wanted to make sure we could talk about a little bit about how we determine those deficiencies in the diet um, and how to determine what supplementation we needs we need. And this is going to depend um, pretty you know widely dependent on what the base of that cow's diet is. Um, Garland went through that a little bit about some of the difficulties or the challenges that we have for each of those. Um, but I'll go through those um, here just a little bit, um, there's quite a bit of those factors that will affect forage quality um, and quite a few of those that we saw this year, um, at least around my area, the first cut hay, um, it was just so wet and rainy um, that we really couldn't get in there until that first cut was actually fairly significantly mature. Um, and that really decreased the overall digestibility and quality of that feed. Um, but outside of maturity, the forage type, the forage species, um, harvest method, storage method, length of storage, um, and the environment are definitely big impacts of uh, forage quality. And so that's why it's so important that we don't use book values. Uh, we're actually figuring out what those requirements are of the feed that we're providing. So when looking at the overall variability just in the maturity of those forages, um, these are just some averages um, off of our brand's ration software um, of that vegetative grass-based pastures averaging upwards of 18 um, plus percent in the early vegetative uh, stages. But as you move into those really you know, late bloom mature forages, we're seeing you know, as low as 7, 6, 7, 8 percent um, protein during that time, which is getting fairly low. Um, and that 
TDN getting pretty darn low too at about 50%. Um, on the opposite side of that, it's kind of a double-edged sword um, because the NDF for the fiber content of those feeds are starting to increase as well, um, which as we talked about earlier, are going to start putting a real limitation on how much of that, uh, that feed stuff that that cow can consume. So we're wanting to make sure we know what exactly um, we're feeding um, before we go into uh, trying to see what's deficient. And so how do we do that? Um, I will always um, try and challenge everyone um, to, to test what's in your forages, your grass, your hay, your silages, um, and not test it when you put it up, but test it before you're going to feed it um, because there are quite a bit of those uh, impacts that will go through with environment and storage um, that might change that. Um, and if you're not comfortable trying to test on your own um, or not comfortable with it, um, you know, that's what we're here for. Um, go ahead and let us know or one of your local extension offices um, to provide some assistance and get some uh, um, resources available to you. Um, and as for what labs to go to, these are just a few. Garland mentioned um, a few others, Dairyland and Rock River. Um, there's different um, labs you can go with, um, but all can give you a pretty good um, indication of what's in your forages. Now, just to, to come back to this chart here for a second, this is our protein requirements and just a few different um, uh, examples of what you might see as far as protein goes. Um, this top dotted line is just a 10% protein grass hay. Um, that second one is a 8% protein corn silage. And that bottom is about a 6% protein corn stock bale. And so what you'll see is that for most of those, um, at least the grass hay, the grass hay is um, going to not going to be able to meet her requirements for protein during those first few months. It might be just fine for the rest of the year, but definitely not during that first uh, few months in that peak lactation area. And for corn silage, we'll see that both for that first few months as well as right before she's getting ready to calve again. All right, and those corn stalks definitely needing some additional protein there for this cow in particular. However, when looking at it from an energy standpoint, um, corn silage is notoriously fairly high in energy, um, so that's not something that I'm really going to be overly concerned about um, outside of inclusion rate. Um, but from a grass hay standpoint, again, um, just not able to meet her energy requirements at peak lactation or getting really close to that uh, high fetal development um, in corn stalks either. Generally, why we uh, decide to put graze cows on corn stalks during that um, after weaning period because we can meet that. But outside of that, we'll ne need to make sure we're including um, additional forms of supplementation. So how is that determined? Well, we really need to go back into looking at um, what is the quality of the feed to determine how much of it she's going to eat. Um, those lower quality, lower digestible feedstuffs, um, those are going to have to take longer in the rumen to digest, and so they're really going to limit how much she can consume of that per day. Um, so when looking at some of those lower quality forages, um, maybe you know up up to 2.2 percent, uh, maybe even less for some of those really Really, really bulky, dry, uh, low quality feeds. Um, but as we get up to those average to high, we could see 2.5 to 2.7 for a lactating. So just to go through a quick example here of how to figure out how much to supplement, um, I'm just going to use this low-quality lactating cow as an example. Um, again, this 1,400-pound cow we've been talking about, um, and if she is able to eat 2.2% body weight, Roughly, she should be able to eat about 30.8 pounds of hay per day on a dry matter basis, which again is how we're going to have to balance for uh, our nutrition. Now, if that 30.8 um, pounds of hay was a 10% protein hay, that would give her roughly just over 3 pounds of protein per day. Now, this cow we talked about is a pretty above average milker. Um, and if I go and I look at her book value for where her protein requirements are, and that came out to about three and a half pounds of protein per day, she should be roughly deficient in almost 0.4 to half a pound of protein per day and need that as supplementation. Now, if we were looking at that from a TDN standpoint, that'd provide her about 16 pounds of TDN. And again, if her, uh, if her requirement is about 19.5 pounds of TDN, she's going to be deficient in about 3.5 pounds. So that gives me a rough idea um, of what she should be getting and what her supplementation needs to be. 
So now I get to break out my pen and paper and uh, start doing some math. Um, if I'm looking at how much she needs to be supplemented, oh, I've got corn available to me, and I've got some modified distillers available to me. I can figure out how much of each of those I'm going to need to feed, um, and then figure out what the low-cost basis for that is. Now I'm going to kind of go through this a little quick, but as I, uh, as Beth so kindly stated earlier, if you need to go back and look at this, we are recording this um, and posting at the conclusion um, of tonight, so we will have this available. But when I'm looking at which supplementation um, I want to feed, I need to look at what my deficiency is and then divide that by the nutrient content of that particular feed. So in this case, my corn that I tested was 90% TDN, and my modified distillers are 94% TDN. Okay? So if my need is 3.5 pounds of TDN, I need to divide that by that 0.9 to get roughly about 3.89 pounds of corn that needs to be fed to that cow, again, on a dry matter basis. Well, unfortunately, I do not feed corn on a dry matter basis, so I need to convert that to as fed. Um, and so to do that, again, I can... I, divide my need by the dry matter content of that feed. Um, so in this case, that feed stuff, that corn, is going to be 86% dry matter. And when I divide 3.89 by 0.86, I come out to about 4.5 pounds of corn that I need to supplement a day to meet her requirements there. Now, if corn's roughly 3.15 a bushel, I'm probably pretty low right now, um, that comes out to about a quarter a day that she's going to need for supplementation. When I do the same thing for modified distillers with roughly 94% TDN and then about 50% dry matter content of our modified distillers, that'll come out to about 7.44 or almost 7.5 pounds of modified distillers that I need to supplement. Um, but when I convert that cost per ton, which 50 bucks a ton is what I put for my modified distillers, um, that comes out to about 19 cents a day uh, for my supplementation of those modified distillers. So pretty comparable um, or uh, competitive for each of those um, in particular. So once I've figured out how much of that supplementation I need, I can start comparing to find my least cost. And this is just a few um, different examples, again, um, of just some different forages mixed with some different supplementation strategies um, and what those costs come out to um, per head per day total for the ration. Um, fairly competitive would be some of those corn stocks with cracked corn and modified distillers um, coming out to a buck 47 roughly for a late gestation ration as long as I've got that nice feed wagon in there. Um, if not, and I've got to mix some of my own with that um, uh, fresh cut grass or first cut grass hay um, with about 15 pounds of modified distillers comes out to roughly $1.74 per day. Um, or if I'm a mostly corn silage based ration, um, I can balance that out with about 12 pounds of that first cut hay and 11 pounds of that corn gluten feed um, and come up to roughly about $1.63 per day. Um, so then I can start looking at what, am I, what are my rations and uh, what potential um, low cost strategy is it that I want to go through. So just a few things that I want to make sure that I mention, um, mostly just because uh, we really focused on crude protein and energy for this talk, um, but I really want to make sure, um, especially with some of the health concerns that um, I've heard about over last winter, um, that we really don't forget about the mineral content of the feed either. Um, a big thing that I really like to make sure that I preach is that gestational mineral requirements for that cow um, are going to be much different than what she might have at other times of the year. Um, and again, that could be either um, due to the fetal requirements um, and what that fetus, growing fetus, is needing from the dam, um, but also as she's starting to prepare immunoglobulins um, for her colostrum as well as overall milk um, production. Um, so I really want to make sure that I'm starting to look at that mineral content. Now, calcium to phosphorus is a pretty big one, too, as we start including more of our uh, um, corn byproducts into our rations. Um, generally, we want that at about a 2 to 1 calcium to phosphorus ratio. Um, but as we start to include more of those, we start bumping up the, the phosphorus in the, in the ration as we start looking at more of those corn products. So we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're considering that since we really can't add enough calcium to offset that phosphorus without 
without starting to negatively impact um, the taste and the palatability of that feed, um, which is definitely not something that I want to do if I want her to consume as much as she can um, to meet her requirements. Um, but if I can at least get that to balance to a one and a half to one ratio, um, she should be set pretty well. Now, as far as vitamin goes, um, a lot of those are, are pretty readily made in the rumen by the rumen bugs, um, with the big exception of vitamin A and vitamin E. Um, we can see those, and the cow will get plenty of those when she's out grazing and consuming fresh green forages, um, but she's not going to get those during the winter months um, if she's consuming hay, um, you know, especially some of those more mature, um, lower quality forages and corn stalks. Um, so her, her stores, you know, that she can keep in those vitamins in her fat are only going to last her a few months, um, but she'll deplete those pretty readily after that. Um, and so making sure that we're uh, getting that vitamin A and vitamin E in that cow is going to be extremely important, especially when we have those cows out on corn stalks or consuming that lower quality hay. Um, otherwise, we'll start running into deficiency issues. Um, could see issues with some stillbirths, but further, you know, um, issues might be so far as causing some blindness issues, white muscle disease, and others. Um, so I'm definitely wanting to make sure that I'm correcting those deficiencies um, prior to getting to this late gestation um, phase and making sure that I've got that in the diet, okay? So I know I went through quite a bit, um, but the big take-homes that I really want to make sure uh, that we talk about have, are really just meeting those requirements during this late gestation and early lactation phase is just absolutely critical um, in more ways than one. Um, but the only way that I can make sure that I'm actually able to meet those requirements is if I actually know what's in my feed. And we need to make sure we're taking uh, some feed analysis, forage analysis of those feedstuffs, um, especially with the, the limited forage resources I think that many are going to have heading into this winter. Um, and I think some of the low quality forages that we might not even know that we've got sitting out in the field or out in the barn. Um, so we want to make sure we're supplementing those cows in a way um, where I can strategically give each cow what she needs to do, um, what she's going to need, um, and know what's in my feedstuffs. Um, at this point in time, um, definitely want to make sure we're taking inventory um, of hay supplies and forage supplies, uh, making sure we have enough quality, high quality feed to meet requirements, and if not, knowing what resources I have available um, in order to do so. Um, but the big thing that I like to say is just don't let your cows get behind, and right now is where a lot of those cows will start getting behind. Um, and it's important to maintain that body condition score, um, again, to make sure I'm keeping up with my calving intervals and my uh, my lifetime productivity of the, that beef cow um, and having helping her work for me. Um, and if I can, um, getting out and starting to think of ways that you might be able to get those cows sorted a little bit um, with some of those thinner or younger cows separated from those bigger cows that are going to bully them away from feed um, and making sure that those in particular don't get set back because they're the ones um, that really end up getting set back pretty quick. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to mention as well um, is that if math wasn't your favorite class in high school like it wasn't for mine, uh, we do have some pretty phenomenal brands, ration formulation software available at the Iowa Beef Center website. Um, that will keep, you know, do all your math for you and uh, keep take into consideration all of those differences that lead to nutritional requirements, um, differences uh, that we discussed earlier about age, weight, uh, weather conditions, adverse weather conditions um, and you can plug it all in there and go um, but again like I said we need to make sure we're testing our feeds if we're going to input that um, but please go ahead and go uh, to our beef center website um, and check that software out so I think with that I'm gonna see if Beth's got any questions for us or has read any on the Q&A so far thank you for joining our webinar hopefully you learned something Again, this is the first webinar in a four-part series. The next one is January 22nd. We'll go over some prepping for the calving season. Our the veterinarian, Dr. Grant Duell, will talk some on that. And we'll also have neonatal calf management um, discussed some by Chris Clark. It, speaking of prepping for the calving season, if you don't have a calving book yet, um, Dr. Loy in the back of the room just pointed out, send Iowa Beef Center an email and we can get a calving book sent to you. 
Uh, the other dates are February 18th and March 10th. Don't feel like you have to make them all. Hop on when you can and hopefully you um, take advantage of a viewing location if, you're, if it's in your county. But if you like watching it from home, we can't blame you for that either.